nothing frightens me like teaching on the doctrine of God for two reasons. The first reason is that I can never stand before you and pretend that I know God fully to the level that I can present him to you with confidence. And number two is that whenever God is presented to people, a specific result is expected. And how about if I fail to produce that result from you? Because every time God is presented to a people, worship must follow. Honor and reverence must follow. So when it comes to the, what we are learning right now, this is our second, third lesson, the doctrine of God. Eh? It scares me. It scares me. We were preparing this message at night because I shake, I tremble. I say, how about if I, I don't present God accurately? And if I present him to the level that he has revealed himself, how about if the people reject him? It is challenging for me. But it's exciting at the same time to teach on God, teach on God. Because I can confidently teach the truth revealed about God and anyone who listens keenly to the truth revealed about God, you get to know him better, you get to serve him better, you get to represent him here on earth better. Every confusion you are seeing in the world is because everybody has what he knows about God. A friend of mine, Moses, said like this, if we are all here told, close your eyes, then someone leads us one by one to an elephant and tells us, touch this animal. You touch it. Then you go back in a room and write what you, you know. All of us will come up with our own thing. Someone will say, I touched a snake. I touched a snake. Will that be true? But there's something on an elephant that looks like a snake. Someone will say, I touched a rock. Because that person touched maybe the body of the elephant. And the one who said, that must have been a trunk of a tree. The one who touched the leg. So each and every one of us will say something about that elephant, which is not the elephant. You get it? But if all that we say is put together, maybe we'll be describing the elephant. So if all that we say is put together, maybe we have a, a rough picture of an elephant. So, when that person says, I touched a snake, you don't push him away. Don't push him away. Because that's the far he knows the elephant. That's the far he has explored. So you need to listen to the next person and next person and next person and next person as you draw the complete picture of the elephant. So, what we are going to do, we are going to look at this elephant <laughs> and try and draw it. But at every step, you need to be knowing that there is much, much, much more to be known about this. At every step. So, we want to look at something called the essential being of God. The essential being of God. Essential means that who really God is. Most theologians will call this the essence of God. A, a word that comes closer to explain the essence of God is nature, the nature of God. That one can come closer. But nature may not actually bring it out, but it's the word that can bring us closer to understanding what are we studying. So the nature of God. So as we study the nature of God, Last time, we were looking at a question, is God knowable? Can anybody know God? And the answer was, yes and no. Yes, because there is truth that God has revealed in the Bible that you can know accurately. And if someone asks you about God, you can say, this is who God is based on the truth he has revealed in the Bible. But again, God is more than what we read in the Bible. He is infinite. And 
the knowledge of God cannot fit in our finite mind. We are too small to understand everything about God. So, can you know God? Yes. Can you know God? No. Yes, because he has revealed himself to the capacity that my mind can understand and my mind can process and say this is the truth about God, but no, because God is bigger than the revealed truth. Is bigger than the revealed truth. Now we have another question here. Since God is knowable, can he be defined? Can you define God? And I beseech you like Paul, take this very serious. Very serious. This will either move you closer to God or make you get confused. So take it very serious. How do you define God? Can God be defined? So, we understand that God can be known, that he desires to be known, and that he reveals himself in a way that makes sense to the human mind. That one we dealt with it last time. We know that God reveals himself throughout the Bible only to the capacity that the finite human mind can truly comprehend. I'm using this truly because the revelation of God in the Bible is truth. It's truth. So you can know truth about God. And we went through this several times, maybe for the sake of those who are joining for the first time, we went through this for several times. Like, uh, uh, if I asked uh, my bishop here, Ike, if I asked you, do you know me? You can say Yes. You can say, okay, say something you know about me. As a teacher of the word. Is that true about me? But there are so many things about me that he can never come to know. So there's a truth that I have revealed to you that you can know about me, but there are things that you will die without ever knowing about me. So when we say we know God, it's because we know the truth that has been revealed. If you look at uh, 1 John chapter 3, from verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Who is this him? God. We should be called children of God. And the reason the world does not know us is because it did not know him. Now look at here. Now Let's come to us again. So beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, again he will be revealed. When he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So there is something that is remaining that we shall start understanding it in full when we are glorified in heaven. Right now we know things about God. What we know about God is called truth. Because there is the self-disclosure of God, self-revelation of God, and he puts it in his word. He communicates his self-disclosure in the Bible. But something that we need to start understanding that God is bigger than the Bible. Bigger than the Bible. So, there is therefore need for us to accelerate our study and consider the possibility of defining God. The nature of a person or of a thing can be defined by the use of a word or a phrase. That's why Ike has used a phrase, a teacher of the word. That's a phrase. If you ask my mother, this is my son. Someone can describe me anyway. Lorin will tell you father. The other girl will tell you husband. And according to them, they, they are defining me. Now, if you meet Lorin and ask, do you know that man? He says, that's my father. Is that enough about me? No. You have not made my wife to say, this is my husband. You have not made my father to say, this is my son. You have not made the church to say, this is our pastor. You, not, you know, there are so many aspects of the same person. And you can either define them in a word or in a phrase. Throughout the Bible, we come across numerous words or phrases that God uses to disclose himself to man. 
These words and phrases express what is generally known as the attributes of God. The attributes of God. We, however, must not forget that God cannot be limited to a word or a phrase since he is far much more than his attributes. He is far much more than his attributes. Please, even if you know all the attributes of God, don't limit God to his attributes. There is always something extra that you don't know about God. There's something that you don't know about him. Anytime. You know, even when you're in heaven, we'll never know him fully. That's why he'll be the center of attraction. That's why the four creatures, they have many eyes, but they don't know him all. They just say holy. Holy. They look at him. They holy. When holy, holy they, they, every day, 24 hours. They are, they, and they have many eyes. Leave alone as we have two eyes. It is an act of arrogance for anybody to say, I know God. But I must put a disclaimer here. Don't limit God to the things that we are going to learn here. He'll be bigger than the things we learn here. Praise God. But even what we will learn here is also big. We don't want to limit God, but God discloses himself. This one is called self-disclosure of God. He discloses himself. Self-revelation of God. He does it himself. He doesn't wait for you to figure out who is God. He never waits for you to figure out. He has never left room for you to think on yourself. So who is God? Who is God? The very moment you start thinking on yourself and coming up with your own God, what you end up with is an idol and not God. Until you base your understanding of God on the self-revelation of God as found in the Bible, you have an idol. Father, no one can ever claim to have a complete and final definition of who and what God is because of the limitations and restrictions imposed to us by human language. Human language. I see even when you are talking in your mother tongue, there are things you can't define in your mother tongue. What is this now? How do we call it in mother tongue? How do you call this one in Swahili? How do you call this one in English? Lang human language is limiting. Some things are experienced but can never be defined. The experiences you have that you can never define. Like how do you define how you feel when you are praying? And you feel like you are so connected to God. How do you define that in language? What will you say? I had visitation. God does not visit you and go away. How do you define it? But is that just nice feeling when you are worshipping and you are praying and you are just enjoying eh? Nesema, that uh, I was in the presence of God. But if you say you are in the presence of God, we will be learning very soon that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time in the same capacity. So who is not in the presence of God? So there are things you'll discover that even the language we use, as you move closer to understand the word of God, even what to speak disappears. Too much noise goes away. So we have a limitation. Human language is a limitation. However, the Bible in many ways therefore reveals the attributes of God based on the self-disclosure of what he is and the evidence of what he does. What he is and what he does. That's how we come to know him. And that's how you see the entire, uh, we'll be looking at the names of God briefly, not today, but in, in the near future. <laughs> the names of God. And you'll see Old Testament names of God well, because of what he does. Because they never understood what he is. They will look at what he has done and they'll say, this is God. This is God. That's why they have several names of God depending on their experience with God. So they based their definition of God on his doings and his doings. 
the definitions of God are therefore descriptive of his perfect and inherent qualities, most of which cannot be exhaustively expressed in any human language. So perfect, inherent is internal qualities, inborn, inbuilt qualities, inborn or inbuilt qualities, most of which cannot be exhaustively expressed in any human term. We are laying a foundation. We are laying a foundation to study the essential being of God. But before we start studying them, we need to get these principles that God is perfect. Most of his uh, descriptions are perfect and inherent. They are in God, in build. In build. Next. So in an attempt to define a person who is well known to you, it is absolutely impossible to find the one description that recognizes and addresses the entirety of his nature, the entirety of his body parts, his abilities, his mind, and his emotions. Now think about someone who is so close, close to you. Get out. Someone like Nancy. How can you define her to reach a point that you are so sure you have covered the entirety of his body, body parts, abilities, mind, emotions, nature. How can you define her? It's only 10%. So you see, if you say that I have a definition of Nancy, she's not a compatible woman. Have you addressed her as a good teacher in school? You've not. So there are abilities that she has that can never be addressed by your definition. There, her mind, her thoughts that you'll never know. You know, there's a time you sit across with her on the table and uh, you see her smiling, but she's asking God, God, you just chose this man for me. <laughs> Among all these men in this world, you just saw me to be this man. And she's smiling, looking at you, you think that she's happy, but she's asking God questions. You'll never know her mind. <laughs> you can never address the mind of somebody. <laughs> You can never understand the emotions. You can never be so sure that this is the way my wife will react when I do this. That this is the way my children will react when I do this. You can never understand the emotions of people. So if the people we live with each and every day, they are difficult for you to understand, the people that you see every day, how much more God? How much more God? If you are to look at a woman and define her as beautiful, in as much as this may be true concerning her appearance, but it fails short of addressing very many other aspects of her life. For example, the health of her body organs, her temperaments, her social inclinations, or her intellect. You say, oh, you are so beautiful. But someone has a rotten lung. See this one? I normally see on uh, Pastor Chris's birthday, uh, Susan puts a photograph of him in the Facebook and say, look at the hunk of a man that I'm married to. But a man has no lungs. <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> you, if you remember he has no lungs, you remove the photograph, you know. <laughs> so there are ways we describe people that don't fully capture who they are. In human terms, there's no way you can capture completely what somebody is. You miss a lot and maybe you will never ever reach that level. Similarly, the infinite attributes of God are incomprehensible with the human mind and cannot be the basis for defining God exhaustively. Cannot be the basis of ex defining God exhaustively. Does this awaken your thinking? It awakens your thinking, eh? Given the diverse religious dispositions, man is often tempted to emphasize particular attributes of God in a way that relegates the rest to a place of lesser value and concern. Because we don't know God and our, our diverse religious dispositions, we do what we call we make a God that we can manage. 
Theologians say reducing God to a manageable God. Manageable God. We cut him to size. <laughs> we cut him to size. Let's think, let's think together here. When you hear people say Pentecostals, what is the most part of God that they want to promote? They are Pentecost, eh? Because they talk about the Spirit of God so much, but Pentecostals, they want to promote the power of God. That's where the mighty man came from. They want to promote only one aspect of God, power. And that's why you see a Pentecostal preacher must come and shout to prove the power of God, must do a few gimmicks to prove the power of God, because what is important to him is only one part of God that he knows, power. But is God only power? God cannot just be power alone. He is many other things beyond power. Now, if you found those who call themselves radical grace ministers, what do they promote? Love. God is a God of love. And they don't want to hear anything else about God. God is love. And everything about God is God's love. He could not do without me. He died on the cross. If God died for me, it's not God. My God is eternal. He cannot die. God used the human body to stay on earth for the three years. Then at the cross, God separated himself from the human body. That's why the human body was crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? If your God died on the cross, he is not God. God is eternal. He escorted the human body to the cross. Then he separated himself and said, you die. You are the one who sinned in the garden of Eden. Die. After you have paid for the sins, then you reunite again. If your God can die and your God can be buried, then there's no God you are worshipping. Okay, we will see the attribute of God. I think we will begin learning the attribute of God called eternity. So you will see eternity, the meaning of eternal life, eternity. Then think about it again. Ask yourself, did God die for me on the cross? Hebrews 10 verse 5. So let's look at this one that we... We are used to. Therefore, when he came into the world, who is the Bible referring to as he? You already know. When he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but, what is this? You have prepared for me. So he came to the world. When he got to the world, there was a body prepared for him where he lived. While he on earth. So he lived in that body. Ensured that our sins are paid for by that body. At the cross. When the body had paid for sins. The body was buried. Rose again. He rejoined the body. And now they are together forever. But a body. You have prepared for me. This statement here. In burnt offering and sacrifices you of, for sin. You had no pleasure. Out of what we are learning, this one proof that Christ came to the world willingly knowing that he's coming to die on the cross. Willingly. The death of the cross was not something that he just came and found that, oh, so that uh, now I'm here, I must die. When he was crying at Gethsemane, he was not refusing to die. He knew all through that he'll come and die on the cross and pay for our sins you will see most denominations build on one attribute of God. And they don't want to hear anything about God. Uh, if you go to Lowland, is when you find that there. They have these Roho churches. And even they don't accept everything about the Holy Spirit. There is one that the Holy Spirit who sees you know, there's the one they call Ra of Wenyi. What is of Wenyi even? God who reveals. So if you go in a Ra of Wenyi church, you are going to hear revelation, which is prophecy. That's what they do from morning to evening. They cry, they lie down on the floor, Ra of Wenyi. The one who sees. So we find that this is the church of the Holy Spirit who sees. This is the Holy Spirit who reveals. This is the Holy Spirit who heals. And even when you see them with those... Um, no, there are, are those things they hang in their churches. Like the ones, like these ones, eh? <laughs> they, 
They just don't hang any clothes there. They hang clothes for Angel Michael, for this angel. They have clothes for angels. When you see a red one, that's Angel Michael, danger. You find that their disposition is just only a little aspect of God. And that's where they are lost. They don't want to hear anything else about God. But a Bible student must know all that God has revealed himself to be. So when that happens, God is wrongly presented and the definition of his perfect nature severely violated and abused. And abused. And that is a problem even with the grace ministers. God is love. The only thing they know about God is love. Until now, they are writing and saying, the Old Testament prophets, they lied about God. You've read them on Facebook. They say everything Isaiah said was not true about God. His only Christ was come to say the truth about God. And that is a God who dies for you. He loves you. Period. No other God. Hey, the Old Testament prophets were just imagining things and writing them down. Because the only thing they want to hear about God is love. Anything that is not love is not God to them. So, not everybody who comes to you and says that he's a minister of the gospel of grace now is actually a minister of the gospel of grace. So, God is always misrepresented or wrongly misrepresented and his nature is severely violated and abused. All the attributes of God are inseparable, interrelated, and interdependent. So when we say God is love, we must also remember God is eternal, God is righteousness, God is all power, God is all present. So we must all remember that so that you are not only lost in one corner that God is love. Imagine if God was love alone and he was not a God of justice. What will happen? Then Jesus will never have died on the cross for you. Because the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was justice being fulfilled at the cross so that we can be saved. So in as much as we want to shout about the love of God, let us also shout about his justice, his righteousness, his power, his all-knowing Everything about God. Let's know it. Let's know it. So that we are not walking on one foot. But if you listen to most sermons, it's walking on one foot because it's just God is love. God is love. All the attributes of God are inseparable. Inseparable. You can never separate them from one another. You can never Okay, let's try this. If you looked at uh, Sister Sally and you said, Sally is tall. Is that true? She's tall. Can you separate her being tall from being slim? Can you separate and say, because Sally is tall, now you don't want to know if she is slim? Is that possible? What else do you know about Sally? Let's try and define her. She's tall, she's slim. She's generous. She's humble. She's a prayerful woman. So all those things, where do they find their source in Sally? Can you separate now the tall Sally from the slim Sally from the intercessor? Can you separate them? No. No, no, no. So they are inseparable. Now, another thing is they are interrelated. None of them works independent of the other. None. There's no aspect of God that works independent of the other. So when we say God is love, is that's not independent from God is righteous. You must understand God is righteous. It's not independent from God is just. It can never be independent from God does not change. You know, it's the several aspects of the same person. So they are inseparable, interrelated, and interdependent, which means they depend on one another. 
They are related. They depend on one another. The attributes are not different parts of what God is. They are not different parts of what God is. The attributes collectively define the divine being. So all of them together, they bring a picture we can use and say, this is who God is. All of them put together. None of them alone can define the entirety of God. But each individual attribute is true of God. It's true of God, but it's not exhaustive of God. None of the attributes operates independent of the rest, and none of the attributes is preeminent over the rest. And this is very important for us to know so that we don't start promoting one attribute over any other attributes. Since God is the most perfect being and the cause of all other things, his attributes are sometimes referred to as the perfections of God. God is perfect in all his being and all his existence. He is perfect. So you will find somewhere else when you are hearing about the attributes of God or the essential being of God, you will hear someone talking about the perfections of God. Let's read the Bible now. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 3 to 4. Mm -hmm. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright he is he. Now, let's look at that scripture and try and see how many definitions of God are you seeing there. He's the rock. Moses defines him as he is the rock. Uh -huh. Any other? He is perfect. He is justice. He is righteous. He is upright. And he is great. In one sentence. In one verse. Okay, two verses. Moses defines God in many ways. And he says, For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to God. Now, are you seeing what I was telling you? When you start knowing God, the next thing you do is worship. Moses says, ascribe greatness to God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Now, if you just wanted to study this alone, you can spend all your years doing a thesis on this and you'll never finish. You'll never finish. That's when you start knowing that this God I'm talking about is bigger than what I know. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. So, your father in heaven is being referred to as perfect. That's why they call his nature the perfections of God. The perfections of God. There are many other scriptures that you can refer to on the same. Let's read one. Let's read one more. So look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 14. I know. Who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Solomon, eh? And the testimony of Christ about Solomon was what? Among all men, he's the most wise, apart from Christ himself. So, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. This is the implication. If you have done something that nobody can improve on, what have you done? Is it not a perfect job? If you have done something that nobody can improve on, it's a perfect job. I think it's only men who understand this kind of theory. It's only men who understand this, that what God has done, no one can add on it, and no one can take away. You know, when a man goes to the bathroom and 
takes a shower. The same soap he has used to wash that is the same one that he applies on himself and walks away. That's why you hear men smelling like uh, all soaps in the life boy. <laughs> we have no problem with what God has done. We don't add on it. We don't subtract from it. <laughs> Let's try James chapter 1 verse 17. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of shadows. Now, a perfect thing and a good thing cannot come from a God who is imperfect. So if all good things and all perfect things come from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadows, then this by implication, Bible doctrine is either by facts stated in the Bible or by implication. So this by implication is that God is perfect. And that's why his attributes are called the perfections of God. The perfections of God. So, in an attempt to define God in a manner that is comprehensible with the finite human mind, the Bible provides two reliable approaches. There are two biblical reliable approaches that we use now to come and say we can define God. And there our big words are anthropomorphism. The Bible severally ascribes to God human attributes, human personalities, human form, and human characteristics. God does this so that he can bring it in a way that you can understand. At the eye of God goes to and fro. God has no eye. God is spirit. But God wants you to understand that he is seeing you wherever you are. He wants you to understand his omnipresence and omniscience maybe. That there is nowhere you can. And that's why David understanding this in Psalms 139 Let's read from verse 1. He says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Wow. Now, what did David know to reach a level that God, I'm not going to hide from you. Once we are finished doing the attributes of God, we will come and pick a passage like this and now we start seeing which attribute is David speaking about. One, two, three. We'll be lining them down, picking a passage and bringing out what is God doing. If you are a Bible teacher, you always must answer which attribute of God is being manifested in this scripture. You need to. So that when they are talking about the righteousness of God, you are just not stuck on love. When they are talking about justice, you are not just stuck on love. So, we have anthropomorphism, which means the Bible uses human attributes, human personality, human form, and human characteristics to define who God is. The face of God, the eye of the Lord, your ear has heard, your hand, yeah? 
the hand of God. So we ascribe the form of God. Help me, which other form do you read in the Bible? The mind of God. Yes, mind of God. The finger of God. Yes, the finger of God. Now, that's called anthropomorphism. Then uh, the next part, anthropopathism. Similarly, the Bible in many places ascribes to God human feelings and emotions. God is not human. All this language is being used to help us define our God. Which feeling do you hear in the Bible? When we are talking about love as a verb, it's a feeling, isn't it? When you talk about love as an action, it comes from a feeling. When you talk about anger, jealous, joy, yeah? We were saying like today, God delights. Yeah? God delights. That's an emotion. God is standard in everything. He's absolute in everything. But for us to be able to understand what this passage means, the Bible uses human feelings. And you know you can relate to these feelings and therefore you can use that to understand who God is. So there are these two areas in the Bible. And as you read the Bible, try to identify anthropomorphism and anthropopathism. As you read the Bible, try to identify. You'll start enjoying your Bible. You'll write things in green, in red, in blue, until you have nowhere to write in the Bible. So now we use those two to do. There are two major classifications of God's attributes based on his self-disclosure as both an infinite and personal God. So we have gone through this. Infinite is beyond human understanding. Personal is relational. That's why when we call him personal, we look at him as though he has intellect, he has emotions, he has a thought, he has a mind. Those are the personal things we are looking at God. So when we are trying to understand him from a personal viewpoint and from an infinite viewpoint, then we understand who God is. So those that are infinite, now you need to breathe in and out because we are going into in the thick of these matters. So we have the first category or classification or a group of God's attributes that they are called the incommunicable attributes. Incommunicable attributes. This represents the characteristics of God which are only within God and are not found elsewhere in the entire creation. The attributes that only belong to God alone. They are called incommunicable because God does not share them with any other person. God does not communicate them with any other person. The word communication has that connotation of fellowship. God does not fellowship with them, with one person. So God is not like man. When we are studying the incommunicable attributes of God, then you come to realize I've been playing with the Someone who I should not be playing around with. That's when you kneel down and worship. Because when you start understanding that it is bigger than what your small mind had revealed to you, all you do is lift up your hands and say, Father. So God is different from man. Therefore, God can neither share his nature with man nor any other of his creation. These attributes of God, whatsoever you do, God can never share them with anybody. The incommunicable attributes are sometimes referred to as natural attributes about God. That's what God is, natural or non-moral attributes. Man has a morality, so when you see non-moral, it means that's not something that God is sharing with man. They are sometimes called absolute attributes. They are sometimes called immanent or intransitive attributes or passive attributes. These are different names you'll find somewhere. So when you find them, and you only know incommunicable, know that, ah, isn't it to me, Najwa? Among the incommunicable attributes of God include his eternity, his self-existence. Self-existence, independence, and freedom are almost the same thing. Self-existence, independence, and freedom. I'll explain something about that. He's omnipresence. Ike, can you be here and be Nigeria at the same time? 
Physically, yes. You can only be in one place at one time. His immutability. God does not change. Don't worry, we'll study them slowly by slowly. We are just trying to mention some of them. But think about Ike just told us in the morning he was living in Karakita and when he went to Karakita you should have listened to what he told me. Wow! I have got a nice house. But now he has changed his mind about that. Now he has another nice house. So Sian, now you will hear him in Runda. Wow! I've got a nice house. Because man keeps changing. I don't know if it happens to a few people in the world. You can have like dinner together as a family. Go and sleep. You have enjoyed dinner. You sleep. You wake up. You have not talked to each other but you have differed in the sleep. Someone is just angry with you. Yesterday we just had a good dinner and went to bed. In the morning what has happened in the night when we were sleeping the person has changed. If you ask all married people, they'll tell you, this is not the man I married. But I saw you wedding with the, this guy. He says, no, it's not the same man I married. Because he has changed. Similarly, women, women change. But God is immutable. We'll pick each and every of those aspects and work on them. I want to say something about his independence. These ones, you can group them together. Self-existence, independence, and freedom. Now, stop and think. If right now, God took all the oxygen away from the world. Who will survive here? So you are dependent on oxygen. Let me say something that you would never think. You never think. If God removed gravity from the world, what would be having it? Some you'll be on your feet, on your head, you know, everywhere. Yeah? Is there a day you have woken up in the morning and thought about gravity? You don't. Think about it. There are things if God removed them you can never survive. Okay, let's try. If there was no water in the world and how about if there was no tea? There are people who will go to Madare. You will find people in the hospital because what is the problem? She has not taken tea for three days. So we don't have freedom. We depend. We are tied to things. I was walking with the mama one day. Then she stopped in the middle of the road. She was trembling. I said, what is the problem? She says, if I don't eat anything right now, I'll fall down. I said, mama, what are you doing? I said, breakfast as boy. You know, I had a maker. So we have to go somewhere. She bites something. Something small. She says, now nah, I'm okay. Because we are dependent. We are dependent on God's creation. But now, if you removed everything from creation, God will still exist. You remove air, you remove food, you remove oxygen, you remove gravity, you remove everything. God will still exist because he depends on nothing. He is self-existing, he is independent, and he is free from everything. He is free. He has no tie to anything. I have had grace people saying, God will not do without me. That's why he sent Christ to die for me. Who taught you? God can do without you and live and exist. He is free from any entanglement to creation. Go to ICU. You will wonder what people are looking for. <gasps> they are looking for oxygen. You wonder where has the oxygen gone? Because you, you have oxygen outside here. Sarah was telling me she was uh, in the hospital and the man next there... It, Sarah was not the one admitted. The man next to her was looking for oxygen. <sighs> because his supply has been switched off. And he died looking for oxygen. Because we are dependent. So, if you just knew this alone, that God is self-existing, he is independent, and he is free. And someone asks you, are you like God? What will you answer? You are not like God. You are not like God at all, at all. Because you, you cannot exist on your own without support. You need so much logistical support for you to exist. 
Even people just without shelter, it becomes a lot of noise. Just without shelter. And God asks, can you build a house for him? He doesn't need shelter. He's self-existing. God is complete the way he is. He is the one who is the source of all things. And the cause of all things. So before you are cheated by some teachings here that you are like God, you need to ask him yourself, am I self-existing? Am I independent? Am I free from everything? If you find that you are attached to food, you are attached to water, you are attached to air, you are attached to gravity, you need shelter, you need clothing, God does not need those kind of things. He is independent. Does that bring worship in your heart? It brings worship. That's what I want to do. Very good question. But let's go, let's go there. First John chapter 4 verse 17. A wonderful question. Remember I've said there are two attributes of God. Eh? Incommunicable. That you can never be like God in this area. But I want to show you the mess we have made with this scripture. Verse 17. It says, love has been perfected among us as in this that we may have boldness in the day of Stop there first and think. What will make you be bold on the day of judgment? One, because your sins have been paid for. Two, because you have a nature that is acceptable to God, which is the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So when you have that nature that is acceptable to God, the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus, when you are standing before the throne of God, you have no fear in you. Because the Bible says here, because as he is, so are we in the world. So the reason why we are bold on the day of judgment is because our sins have been forgiven and we have the righteousness of God, a nature that is acceptable to him. When God is looking at us, he is seeing a reflection of himself in us, imputed righteousness. And that's why the Bible says here, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. That's why you will be bold here. Love has been perfected among us as in this that we may have boldness because you know there is no torment. And there is no torment because all your sins have been paid for. You are forgiven and you have the nature of God, the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So, when the Bible says, because as he is, so are we, what is the Bible saying? We have the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So, we had looked at the independence. So, the psalmist noted that no one can fully define God. And that's why we have read this already. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. What does he say here? Poh. David. David of all the men, the Bible says, he's a friend of God. His heart is after the heart of God. But David says, trying to understand how this God operates is too high for me. It's too high for me. I have tried reaching it. I've tried. Uh-uh. Let me just worship him as God. The Apostle Paul confirms the fact that no one can fully define God by saying, now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. This, this is what it brings out. This is what it brings out. The understanding that this God is bigger than what I thought. It brings out be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It brings out worship. Look at this. God who alone has immortality dwelling in who is writing this? This is Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Grace. In an approachable light who no man has seen or can see to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. You see worship. So now when you are worshipping him. You worship him with understanding. 
with knowledge, with the right language. Do you know language defines everything in the world? Language defines who you are. If you go to accountants, there's a language they speak. If you go to lawyers, there's a language they speak. Engineers, there's a language they speak. Now, if you come to Christians, we must have our language, and this is our language. We cannot just speak. When we are speaking, when we are talking, somebody must understand these are people of the same ilk. These are engineers who are speaking here. Engineers of the word. Eh? People of the way. Yeah, they were called so. People of the way. People of the way. The apostle John confirms that only the person of Jesus Christ can reveal God. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. He has declared him. So, we have a second group or a classification of the attributes of God. They are called communicable attributes. This represents the characteristics of God which are within God and are also found within angels and human beings. Though to a very limited degree. To a very limited degree. They can be communicated. They can be shared. So, man is like God. So, if you are asked, are you like God? Yes, you are. There's a part of God that he has shared with us and a part of God that belongs to him. What he has shared with us is called communicable attributes. And if you are asked, are you like God? You say, yes. So, now, just like we answered the first question, can God be known? The answer was? So is man like God? Yes. Because you cannot answer with one answer. You must explain. So these communicable attributes, they mean that man is not different from God. God, to a limited degree, can share his nature with man. So the communicable attributes are sometimes also referred to as moral attributes, relative attributes, immanent attributes, or transitive. They can be transferred. This transition. They can be transitioned from God to man. Then active attributes because God actively shares them with man. Among the communicable attributes of God include his justice. So God is a God of justice. You know, if you are a normal person, you have a standard of fairness. Even people who don't know God, they'll tell you that's not fair. So, God is a God of justice, but he has shared justice in a way with man, and you find that man, in a way, can reflect the justice of God. Yeah? Even in the war, I don't know if I'm right, Derek, when there's a battle between two enemies, we don't kill children and women. That's why in battles, you see women carrying things. We wonder, where are the men? The men have been shot. The men are, all the men have been killed or they are in the war. But it's international. Anybody who kills women and children is just barbaric. Even an injured soldier. That's general fairness. When you go to the court of law, what are you looking for? Justice. So justice has been shared. Holiness. Holiness. Holiness has been shared. You are moral, yeah? Even people who don't know God, they are morality. You will not find a brother marrying a sister. That's morality. You see, there are standards of morals even in cultures. God has shared them with the humanity. So, you will see some sanity among his men. Even constitutions that are an expression of God's morality, of God's holiness. So, there's omniscience. God has given man wisdom also. God is all-knowing, but he has shared with you in a way you can know so many things also. That's why we say to a limited degree. Yeah? The way you are sitting there, you know how to cook omena. You know some few things about mathematics because sometimes you help children with their homework. 
Yeah? You know how to do your own work in the office? You, you know so much. You know so much. And again, you have wisdom. So love. Love. To a specific aspect, God has shared with us his nature of love. And that's why you can love also. You can love. That's why people are crisscrossing this country. If you ask Shiro, all the way from Muranga, what are you doing in Ibusia? She doesn't understand. If you look at that man, does he look like a man who can tell a woman I love you? But there's a, there must be, have been a way they communicated. It's a mystery. It's a chemistry. God in a way has given us the ability also to express love to other people. We love our friends. We love our children. The teachers love those children that they teach. It's a specific love. I worked in a hospital for some time and I discovered doctors fall in love with their patients. And the love wants to see that patient heal and go home. When a patient dies, a doctor cries. You find a doctor so sad in the mo and you're like, what? Say, we lost the battle. We lost the battle. It's because God has put in us that aspect of love. He has shared with us and kindness and mercy and many more, many more we'll be looking at. As much as the Lord will allow us, we'll look at them. But now, if someone asks you, are you like God? What do you say? Yes. So let's continue. Then God said, let us make man in what? Our image and according to our likeness. Oh, so we carry the image of God and we have some likeness of God. Therefore, we are like God. In his own wisdom, he chose which aspects of his nature he can communicate to us. He can transit to us. He can share with us. In his own wisdom, he chose. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. So we have been given the glory that God has and God has given Christ and now we are given. So God can share. God can share. Look at Ephesians. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God. We have a new man created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the boldness you have when you are standing before God. The new man is created in true righteousness and boldness. And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So, you can answer that question and say, I am like God. But that answer can never stop there. It must be explained. Now, we want to begin by studying one, at least one. Let's look at at least one attribute of God, which is eternity. Now, this is going to be very interesting. I had a struggle in me whether to begin by teaching the doctrine of Trinity or the attributes of God. But I chose to teach the attributes of God before the doctrine of Trinity. Because I want when we learn the doctrine of Trinity, you yourself, you already know. You already know and you can see it. And you'll see as we go through this as an example. So, eternity, this is an attribute which means that God's existence from the present human viewpoint extends endlessly both in the past and in the future. Now this is big. This is big. Because wherever you are standing right now, there is a past, there's a future. You can never go to the past and reach the end of God's existence. You can never go to the future and reach the end of God's existence. You can never. God's existence, from everywhere you are standing, from human perspective, God's existence extends both in the past and in the future endlessly. Endlessly. Actually, creation, God interrupted eternity and placed in eternity time, matter, and space for you to live in so that he can find a way to bring you to live with him forever. Do you know the earth was created for us? This earth was created for us. When we are talking about eternity, 
We are not talking about the eternity we have because our eternity, man has a beginning but God has no beginning. So although God has imputed his very life in us, he has given us eternal life, but we have a beginning. So our eternal life cannot be compared with God's eternity. Because God's eternity extends endlessly to the past and endlessly to the future. God's existence cannot be interrupted or limited with time or changes of events, successions of events. God is forever present from everlasting past to everlasting future. Forever present. These are things that bring peace in your heart. If I was David, I would say, Selah. Selah. It's forever present. This Moses who wrote this, Psalm 90, it was Moses. It says, Lord, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. What is this? You are God. This is Moses. This is Moses speaking. I think I love that. When you understand that, you have peace. That God, you have been you are our dwelling place from every generation, from generation to generation. You have been a dwelling place. Some questions that you have start melting away. Though the eternity of God means that He is free to act outside the limitations of time, yet He is also free to act in relation to time. God is the one who created time, and so He has sovereignty, freedom to act in relation to time. In relation to time. So let's see the relationship of this. Look at this statement that God is free to act outside of time but again he can choose to act within time. So he tells Abraham is anything too hard for me? <laughs> what was Abraham looking for here? A child, eh? Is anything too hard for me? So, if you want to worship here, you can put here every need you have. And here God asking you, this takes reflection. Yeah? What need is that that you have and you are, you are, you are crying and mumbling and complaining and you are uh, uh, almost losing your mind going to Madare because of a need? Is anything too hard for the Lord? So is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed, what does he say? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. Look at that. He's promising Abraham that I will work within the limitations of time. So God can choose to work within the limitations of time. He can choose to work outside the limitations of time. And most cases, he works outside the limitation of time. Time can never limit God. That's why he said, to him, one day can be a thousand years. Three months. So, that's the part of God is free. He's free. He has freedom. He's, you cannot force him to act within time. You cannot force him to act without time. He has the freedom. Look at uh, the birth of Christ says, but when the fullness of... Now who knew the fullness of that time? He's the one who knew it. There's no man who knew. The fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, the nation of Israel, that we, the Gentiles, may receive the adoption as sons. God did not come to redeem us from the law. We were never under the law. There's no Gentile nation that was under the law. So it's only the nation of Israel that was under the law. And Christ's ministry to the nation of Israel was to redeem them from the law. His ministry to us was that we 
may receive the adoption of sons. But the issue here is in the fullness of the time. So God can work within time. God can work within time. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? You know, these guys, they are not even concerned about us. They were just concerned about themselves. Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. I want to prophesy to you three months from today. It's not for you. Prophet is not for you. God himself knows the seasons he has set, the times he has set, the ages he has set, the dispensations he has set. It's God himself who knows. And that's why the fullness of time belongs to him. There's one scripture I wish I could remove from the Bible. Can I show you it? First Peter chapter 1 verse 6. Let's go up first. Let's go up first. Now, if you look at first Peter, it begins very well here. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here you are feeling like, wow. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. Hallelujah. Look at verse 5. You who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed. Here you are speaking in tongues. Verse 6. Now let's look at verse 6. In this, so what is this? In this relationship, eh? In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Now what is this? If God has told you very good things here, you have been begotten again to a living hope. You have an inheritance that is incorruptible. You are kept by the power of God. You rejoice. This is suffering in the Tokewapi. Now who determines for that time you will suffer? Who sees the need that I, may, I need to suffer that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to the praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God can work within time and outside time. Look at the same First Peter chapter 5 chapter 5 verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while he will perfect you establish you, strengthen you and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I have suffered for a while. So these are some of the realities about God that we need to know. Whether you like them or not they are there. So here we have uh, creation does not have any part in the eternity past of God. I want you to note this. All creation has a beginning and does not have any part in the eternity past of God. Creation had a beginning. However, the entire creation has part in the, in the eternity future. We don't know what happened before creation because that belongs to the eternity past of God. But we thank God we have part in the eternity future. Even look at creation. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So when you are being glorified, creation is there with you. Now, I want us to do a small digression here, before we conclude, this is where I will end. But I want us to do a small digression. It's not in the notes, so you have to be keen and take notes about it. So we want to look at how many other personalities does the Bible ascribe eternity to in the Bible? 
Uh, is there anyone else in the Bible who is saying that he has endless past and endless future? Is there any other person in the Bible? So that's what we want to look at briefly. Then we do our conclusion for today's lesson. Number one, you can write down the Bible ascribes eternity to the Holy Spirit. And I want us to look at one scripture. Hebrews 9.14 We see the name given to the Holy Spirit. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through who offered himself without spot to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So what is the name being given to the Holy Spirit here? The eternal spirit. Therefore, we understand that the Holy Spirit is also ascribed with eternity. Just note that. We'll carry it to the next level in the future. This is one of the good verses in the Bible also. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without a spot to God, cleanse your conscience. There's a problem here. This place needs to be cleaned. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make you whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. No other fountain, no, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So here you see, there is something that needs to be cleansed. You know, we always think that it is our flesh, but it's our conscience. And that's the lesson we are learning on Sunday morning. You will see the target is our mind, renewal of the mind. So, from dead works to serve the living God. We'll deal with this scripture in the morning service when we are studying the morning of uh, your body as living sacrifice. We'll deal with it in the morning service. But I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit has been given a name, the eternal spirit. Just note that. Not that. Let's look at another aspect. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God, look at the name of the Spirit, it's called the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. What was the first attribute we learned about God? He is eternal. The eternity of God. So if the Holy Spirit is being called the Spirit of God, by implication, He's eternal. And here, he is there during creation. He's participating in creation, which means he outdates creation. Because he's participating in creation. So the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of God. And we can look at two, three other scriptures which refer to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God, which means that he belongs to God. He is God. He is of God. And therefore, he is eternal. Job 33 and verse 4. So let's look at Job 33 verse 4. The Spirit of God. Uh -huh. Again, you see that? is being referred to as the Spirit of God. Therefore, if God is eternal, then his Spirit also must be eternal. Has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So Job here accredits the spirit with his creation in his mother's womb and the very life that he lives. Now you will discover that those are things that are also ascribed to God, that like it's God who is doing it. The psalmist says that it's God who created him fearfully and wonderfully in his mother's womb. I don't want us to go there. So if Job is saying that the spirit of God has created me, the spirit of God has given me life, those are things that only God can do. 
and then is being called the Spirit of God. So again, that ascribes to him eternity. Uh, Psalms 51 verse 11. Psalms 51 verse 11. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take what? Your Holy Spirit from me. So, you know this story? When David had sinned against God and David thought like, I remember when Saul sinned, the Spirit was taken away from him and he became mad. So David did not want to become mad. So he interceded to God. Say, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Again, the Holy Spirit is being called the Spirit of God. By implication, God is eternal, therefore his Spirit also is eternal. Number two, the Bible also ascribes eternity to the person of Christ Jesus. By implication, the Bible implies that the person of Christ Jesus is also eternal. Now, there are several ways that the Bible ascribes eternity to Christ Jesus. First of all, when the Bible begins by saying, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we come to learn later, actually the God who actively created the heavens and the earth was Christ Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 1 up to 3. So, the works of creation themselves they imply that Christ is eternal since he's the one who is accredited with the works of creation. When the Bible accredits Christ with the works of creation, by implication, Christ is also eternal. Because, so let's see John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. We come to understand that this word of God, of course we are beyond that, but with high knowledge, we understand the word of God is Christ Jesus. Do you know that? The word of God is Christ Jesus according to Revelation 19 verse. Revelation 19, 13 says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in the blood and his name is called, this is Christ Jesus. It's called the word of God. So let's go to John. We have seen that all things were made through the word of God and without him, nothing was made that was made. Uh, verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelled among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then here we start understanding that this Jesus Christ, the Bible is talking about. So, if the Bible is accrediting Christ Jesus with the works of creation, then we need to stop and think that if he is the creator, then he must live beyond creation. So, by giving him that work of creation, then it means that Christ is eternal. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by him, that's Christ Jesus, because he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of a creation. So by him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And that's why I always tell you, me, I, I don't want to waste time on principalities or on municipalities. I don't want. Because they, they were created for Christ. They belong to Jesus. All demons and Satan plus him, Satan himself belong to Jesus. So he knows what he wants to do with them, not me. He knows. So for by him all things were created. So we come to understand that Jesus Christ was the agent of the entire creation. If creation is accredited to Christ, then he lives outside creation. He is eternal. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 10 through 13, I think. 10. Now look, and you Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Who is this? Jesus Christ. He laid the foundation of the earth. So, 
he was not part of creation because he's laying the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. So what does the Bible say in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1? In the beginning, who created? God. What did he create? The heavens and earth. But now here the, in the explanation, it is Christ Jesus. In the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of his hand. They will perish but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a clock. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your ears will not fail. Wow. That is an implication of eternity. So you can say the person of Christ Jesus is eternal because the Bible accredits the works of creation to him. Number two, the Old Testament prophetic revelations, they say Jesus is eternal. The prophetic revelations of the Old Testament. Let's try to read uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is another wonderful scripture if you want to understand the person of Christ Jesus. It says, unto us, a child is born. Unto us, but the Son of God can never be born. He is given. For God so loved the world that he so unto us a child is born, is made who gave birth this child. Then God gave his son. Then the son came to live in the body of this child. So unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. This scripture I preached to uh, the Jehovah Witness and one of them got born again. Because they said they had never seen this before. Let me show you why. Because the child who is born and the son who is given, what is the name of that child? Jesus Christ. Isn't you? Now look at, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his what? Is it names or a name? So his name, and all Bibles, I've checked over 10 translations, they say his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are not the names of Christ. It is the name of Christ. He's the man with the longest name. When the Jehovah Witness noticed that Jesus Christ is being called Everlasting Father, Mighty God, he told me, I surrender. But, part of the name of Christ Jesus is everlasting, ascribing what? Eternity to Christ Jesus. Prophetic predictions ascribed eternity to Christ Jesus. Now, his personal testimony, the personal testimony of Christ Jesus. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Look at him. Who is saying this? Jesus Christ. If you can't believe anybody else, believe his personal testimony. He is calling himself that he is the almighty. We'll read the scripture again when we are looking at the all-powerful God because we must look at self-revelation again. But he says he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He says he, he, he is the one who is now who was before and who is to come. Let's go to verse 17 of the same. And when I saw him, that this John now, you know John had never seen the glorified Christ. Before you experience the glory of God, you joke around with the name of God. Like he's your uncle. But John now, after he saw the glorified Christ, look at what he said. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Ask Daniel. When Daniel saw Jesus Christ, he fainted. He couldn't look up. And he was told, Daniel, wake up. And the Bible says he became sick for four days just for seeing Christ Jesus. Daniel was trembling, you know. Trembling. Ask Isaiah. In the day that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. It changes your perspective completely. It changes it. So, John here said, 
I was like a dead man. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive for how long? Forever. Amen. And I have the keys of heads and of death. But we are looking at the eternity of Christ. Self-declaration. Self-declaration. You understand uh, the seven I am's of the book of uh, John? We know God told Moses, I am that I am. And Christ comes and says, I am. So the seven declarations of I am in the book of John, they are a personal testimony of Christ that I am eternal. Because I am carries the connotation of self-existence self-existence. But let's look at one verse in John chapter 8 verse 58. John chapter 8 verse 58. But Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, this is self-declaration of eternity. I am that I am. That's why the Jews wanted to beat him. Look at them. Then they took up stones to throw at him but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. But look at this. Before Abraham, I am. Wow. Don't blame these guys. You are only 33 years. And you are telling us before Abraham... No, this man needs to be killed. This is treasonable. This is blasphemy. It's an abomination. Don't blame them. Don't blame them. And lastly, throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament, we see Christ being offered worship, which is only due to God. That's again another declaration that he is God, and if he is God, he is eternal. You can read later John 20, 28 Acts chapter 7 verse 59 and 60 and Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 you will see Jesus being accorded worship worship and only God can be worshipped. So God is eternal God is eternity but how many other people are ascribed with the eternal nature of God? We have the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. Just note and leave it like that. We'll know how to compile it up later. So let's go back to our notes and finish. What is the importance of knowing all this? How do you apply it in your life? How do you apply the understanding that you serve, you worship an eternal God? How does it apply to you? Why is it important in your life? Understanding of the eternal nature of God that God has never and neither will he ever cease to exist, gives us confidence that his sustenance and providence are eternally assured. In every situation you are in, wherever you are, whatever time it is, you can never doubt the presence of God. He says, I will never leave you nor I'll forsake you. I will be with you until the end of the age. You have that confidence. However tight things are, you are sure that God is with me in this situation. That's why Elijah told the prophets of Baal, I don't know the God you worship. Try and cry louder. Maybe he's sleeping, he'll wake up. Try and cry louder. Maybe he has gone to visit somebody, he'll come back. Because the God of Elijah was a God who is eternally present. Knowing that God is ever present assures us that we are never alone. Never alone. Regardless of the circumstances of life that we find ourselves in. We know we are never alone. Never ever. Now knowing this, this should elicit both dependence on God and worship. 
Because you know this is a friend who is ever there. You can depend on him. He's not a guy who comes and goes and helps you and goes. He's not a donor. You can depend on him and that should cause worship. Since all the attributes of God are inseparable, interrelated, and interdependent, we are further assured that they are all eternal. So when you hear God loves you, and you know God is eternal, then you know the love of God is eternal. Wow. What an assurance. What an assurance just to have that in every aspect of your life, whenever and wherever, God is very present. <laughs> Today was a tight theological lesson and we'll continue like that. But now we have come to the easy part because now we're just going to be looking at uh, the attributes of God. We'll maybe pick like uh, seven of them or ten and look at them. You cannot look at the entirety of God. But we look at the ones that are so pronounced. We look at them. See how they apply in our lives. See which other personalities in the Bible have the same attributes. Then from there we'll go to the next lesson of the Trinity of God. Which will be an easy thing after we have done all this. It will be so easy to understand after we have done all this. May we give our Lord a mighty hand for giving us a teacher. Thank you, teacher, for teaching us tirelessly. May we pray as we plan to leave this place and go home, prepare ourselves for the next Sunday. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we want to magnify and bless your name. Thank you for such a time as this that you have brought us together to sit at your feet to learn so that we may be able to affect the areas of our jurisdiction. This day, O oh God, we have gone higher, a notch higher to the things that we have learned. I pray and we believe that we are not just learning things, but we are going to internalize and that the learnings that we have will change us and then we shall be able to affect the world around us. We want to thank you because of every learner who is seated in this place. You are going to influence them to be able to, 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 to digest, to internalize, to meditate upon what they have learned. And they become the same. They walk according to what they have received today. And they are going to impact their areas of their lives. Lord, we thank you for the people who will sit at us also again as we teach them. We want to thank you for the gift of the pastor to us to be able to teach so well, so accurately, so tirelessly. Lord, we magnify, magnify your name. As we read this place, we go to our homes. Our homes are safe. Our, our travel at home is safe. When we meet next lesson, oh God, we will be prepared again to learn more. And not only learning, but to become what we have learned. Lord, we bless you. We magnify your name, even as you even as we uh, walk our way through the whole week, we believe that you are blessed and you are going to, we know that you are going to find ways to make it possible for us, even to meet the needs that we have before us, and even the needs of the ones who are weak and the needs of those who do not have because it is possible, because we are able with Christ. Lord, we bless you, we magnify your name, it's in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. And the church say, Amen. amen. Give a mighty clap to the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>